Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Notes from a Big Country by Bill Bryson. So Bill Bryson is mostly known as a travel writer. He grew up in the UK but was born in the US and basically he moved back to the US and these are a collection of some of the uh, newspaper articles he wrote for a British newspaper talking about the differences between the two. So as I usually do, I'm going to read the blurb and then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and give you my overall thoughts and rating at the end. What I will say is a lot of these tabs are just like fun little facts or things that I learned which I thought was cool. Okay, so the blurb. Bill Bryson has the rare knack of being out of his depth wherever he goes, even, perhaps especially, in the land of his birth. This became all too apparent when, after nearly two decades in England, the world's best-loved travel writer upped sticks with Mrs Bryson, little Jimmy A.L., and returned to live in the country he had left as a youth. Of course, there were things Bryson missed about Blighty. The Open University, Boxing Day, Branston Pickle and Irony, to name but a few. But any sense of loss was countered by the joy of rediscovering some of the forgotten treasures of his childhood. The glories of a New England autumn, the pleasingly comical sight of oneself in shorts, and motel rooms where you can generally count on being awakened in the night by a piercing shriek and the sound of a female voice pleading, Put the gun down, Vinny, I'll do anything you say! When an old friend asked him to write a weekly dispatch from New Hampshire for the Mail on Sunday's Night and Day magazine, Bill firmly turned him down. So firm was he, in fact, that gathered here his 18 months worth of his popular columns about that strangest of phenomena, the American way of life. Whether discussing the dazzling efficiency of the garbage disposal unit, the exoticism of having your groceries bagged for you, the jaw-slackening direness of American TV, or the smug pleasure of being able to eat beef without having to wonder if when you rise from the table you will walk sideways into the wall, Bill Bryson brings his inimitable brand of bemused wit to bear on the world's richest and craziest country. So we have something here I thought was quite funny, which is the differences between like English and American terms. But send me to the hardware store and even now I'm totally lost. For months I had conversations with the sales clerk at our local True Value that went something like this. Hi, I need some of that stuff you fill holes in walls with. My wife's people call it polyfiller. Oh, you mean spackle? Very possibly. And I need some of those little plastic things that you use to hold screws in the wall when you put shelves up. I know them as roll plugs. Well, we call them anchors. Crazy start to this article again, and as I say there are a lot of things here that are like statistics and facts that I thought were interesting. Here's a fact for you. According to the latest statistical abstract of the United States, every year more than 400,000 Americans suffer injuries involving beds, mattresses or pillows. Think about that for a minute. That is more people than live in Greater Coventry. That is almost 2,000 bed, mattress or pillow injuries a day. In the time it takes you to read this article, four Americans will somehow manage to be wounded by their bedding. He talks about the, like, the dumbing down of society and I thought this was an interesting example. He says, I first noticed it myself a few months ago when I was watching something called the Weather Channel on TV and the, meteorolo and the meteorologist said, and in Albany today, they had 12 inches of snow. Then brightly added, that's about a foot. No, actually that is a foot, you poor sad imbecile. This is a good explanation of the public schooling system in the UK. On another occasion, when I made reference to someone in Britain attending a state school, an American researcher said to me, but I didn't think they had states in Britain. I meant state in the rather broader sense of nation state. So you mean public schools? Well, no, because public schools in Britain are private schools. Long pause. You're kidding. It's a well-known fact. So let me get this straight. They call private schools public schools in Britain? Correct. Then what do they call public schools? State schools. Another long pause. But I didn't think they had states in Britain. He talks about the joy of having a garbage disposal and he says, I've never had a garbage disposal before, so I've been learning its tolerances through a process of trial and error. Chopsticks give perhaps the liveliest response, this is not recommended of course, but there comes a time with every piece of machinery when you just have to see what it can do. But cantaloupe rinds make the richest, throatiest sound and result in less downtime. Coffee grounds in quantity are the most likely to provide a satisfying Vesuvius effect, though for obvious reasons it is best not to attempt this difficult feat until your wife has gone out for the day and to have a mop and stepladder standing by. He's talking about basements here and he says, Oh, occasionally, especially in starter homes, you'll find that some young gung-ho dad has converted the basement into a playroom for the children. But this is always a mistake as no child will play in a basement. This is because no matter how loving your parents, no matter how much you would like to trust them, there is always the thought that they will quietly lock the door at the top of the stairs and move to Florida. He talks about an exchange he had when he seated himself at a restaurant and um, says, After a couple of minutes, the hostess, the customer seating manager, came up to me and said in a level tone, I see you've seated yourself. Yup, I replied proudly. Dress myself too. Thought this was crazy, he says, any kind of economic activity adds to the gross domestic product. It doesn't matter whether it's a good activity or a bad one. It has been estimated, for instance, that the OJ Simpson trial added $200 million to America's GDP through lawyers' fees, court costs, hotel bills for the press, and so on. 
But I don't think many people would argue that the whole costly spectacle made America a noticeably greater, nobler place. He's talking about motel rooms, and here he says, In consequence, we normally camped in motel rooms where the bed sagged and the furnishings were battered, and where you could generally count on being awakened in the night by a piercing shriek, the sounds of splintering furniture and a female voice pleading, Put the gun down, Vinny, I'll do anything you say. I don't wish to suggest that these experiences left me scarred and embittered, but I can remember watching Janet Lee being hacked up in the Bates Motel in Psycho and thinking, At least she got a, and thinking, At least she got a shower curtain. This just amused me the way this was written. Um... There's a comfort inn across the street, one of my children pointed out. We don't want a comfort inn, Jimmy, I explained, temporarily forgetting in my excitement that I don't have a child called Jimmy. Another example of his sense of humour here, he says, My wife has just called up that dinner is on the table. I'd rather it was on plates, but there you are. He says, and again, I don't know, because this was published in like the 90s, I think, so I don't know how accurate these stats are, but he says, There are 200 million cars in the United States, 40% of the world's total, for about 5% of its population. H.L. Mencken once defined Puritanism as the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. This was a crazy stat. The average American walks less than 75 miles a year, about 1.4 miles a week, barely 350 yards a day. And he talks about how, like, uh, the American justice system is kind of screwed and the police departments aren't always efficient, so he says, uh, even better, in my view, were the sheriff's deputies in Milwaukee who were sent to the airport with a team of sniffer dogs to practice hunting out explosives. The deputies hid a five pound packet of live explosives somewhere in the airport and then, I just love this, forgot where. Needless to say, the dogs couldn't find it. That was in February and they're still looking. It was the second time that the Milwaukee Sheriff's Department has managed to mislay explosives at the airport. So it um, turns out that just, just by being American, it makes you twice as likely, twice as likely as the average person to suffer an accidental death. Uh, we get an example, he, he has someone saying a -ya, spelled A-Y-U-H, which is like a generic New England term that I know from Stephen King. He talks about uh, like the bureaucracy as well of the United States, he says, an inevitable consequence, he says, I mention this because our subject this week is large-scale incompetence. Despite my best efforts, there abounds a terrible myth, which I should like to lay to rest once and for all, that America is an efficient place. It is anything but. Partly this is because it is a big country, Big countries spawn big bureaucracies. Those bureaucracies spawn lots of departments and each of those departments issues lots of rules and regulations. An inevitable consequence is that with so many departments, the left hand not only doesn't know what the right hand is doing, but doesn't seem to know that there is a right hand. This is interestingly illustrated by frozen pizza. In the United States, frozen cheese pizza is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Frozen pepperoni pizza, on the other hand, is regulated by the Department of Agriculture. Each sets its own standards with regard to content, labelling and so on, has its own team of inspectors and its own set of regulations which require licences, compliance certificates and all kinds of other costly paperwork. And that's not just for frozen pizza. This kind of madness would not be possible in a small country like Britain. You need the European Union for that. Uh, he shares here a story that he likes. In June of this year, while travelling alone across America by car, Mrs. Rita Rupp of Tulsa, Oklahoma, got it in mind that she might be abducted by nefarious persons. So, just to be on the safe side, she prepared a note in advance, in appropriately desperate looking handwriting that said, Help, I've been kidnapped. Call the highway patrol. The note then gave her name and address and phone numbers for the appropriate armed authorities. Now, if you write a note like this, you want to make certain that either A, you do get kidnapped, or B, you don't accidentally drop the note out of your handbag. Well, guess what happened? The hapless Mrs. Rupp dropped the note, it was picked up and turned in by a conscientious citizen, and the next thing you know, police in four states had set up roadblocks, issued all points bulletins, and generally got themselves pretty excited. Meanwhile, Mrs. Rupp drove on to her destination, sweetly unaware of the chaos she had left in her wake. This here amuses me because I think it kind of covers my, my opinions on literary prizes quite well. He says, um, I'm equally unable to account fully for another story from the New York Times about a couple who wrote down the gurgling sounds made by their infant daughter, presented it in the form of a poem, typical line, bois 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 bois, submitted it to something called the North American Open Poetry Contest and won a semi-finalist prize. And this crazy story here, he says, the business of changing cubicle spying came to light in 1983 when a customer trying on clothes in a department store in Michigan discovered that a store employee had climbed a stepladder and was watching him through a metal vent. Is this tacky or what? The customer was sufficiently outraged that he sued the store for invasion of privacy. He lost. There's a scene that, he, a little story he writes about the Titanic and he references the band playing Nearer My God To Thee, which was the last thing they played before the ship went down. They were actually playing while the ship went down. It says he was talking about the death penalty. He says, altogether in the United States, there are about 3,000 people on death row. In 1997, 74 of them were executed, the highest number in 40 years. 
Even so, the number added to death row each year outstrips by about 4 to 1 the number eliminated. The leading cause of death on death row is actually natural causes. To clear the backlog and deal with a rising number of new inmates, America would have to execute one person a day for 25 years. Because of the legal process, that's never going to happen. Yeah, here's a crazy thing that you'll, you'll appreciate if you've been watching some of the documentaries that I've been watching on Netflix. So he, he says, um, This would be good news if you were confident that everyone put to death deserved it. But in fact, this is not so. Consider the case of Dennis Williams of Chicago, who spent 17 years on death row for a murder he vociferously claimed not to have committed for the very good reason that he hadn't. He was saved only because a journalism professor at the University of Chicago assigned his students to look into the case as a class project. They found, among other things, that the police had suppressed evidence, witnesses had lied, and that another man was prepared to confess to the crime if only someone would listen to him. He's a te team of university students doing a class project find that out. It's madness. Uh, this tickled me as well. This is the last thing I'm going to read out. And this, this was him talking about the dumbing down of America. He said, um, One thing is certain, and that is that there is an awful lot of dumbness about. I know this for a fact because a friend in New York recently sent me a collection of stupid quotes made by notable Americans in 1997. Here, for instance, is the actress Brooke Shields, without any help from grown-ups, explaining to an interviewer why you shouldn't smoke. Smoking kills. If you're killed, you've lost a very important part of your life. Well said, Brooke. And here is the singer Mariah Carey getting to the heart of third world troubles. Whenever I watch TV and see those poor starving kids all over the world, I can't help but cry. I mean, I'd love to be skinny like that, but not with all those flies and death and stuff. Whatever is the stage beyond the mind-boggling is the stage I read each time I read that quotation. My favourite, however, was the answer Miss Alabama gave in a Miss Universe contest when asked if she would choose to live forever. I would not live forever, because we should not live forever. Because if we were supposed to live forever, then we would live forever. But we cannot live forever, which is why I would not live forever. So I thought this was crazy. It says, in 1989, when an employee of a large Japanese-owned computer products company discovered that the company was routinely reading employees' email, even though it had assured the employees that it was not, she blew the whistle and was promptly fired. She sued for unfair dismissal and lost the case. A court upheld the right of companies not only to review employees' private communications, but to lie to them about doing it. Whoa, another statistic I wanted to share. He says, in fact, and here is a truly sobering statistic. The United States has more lawyers than all the rest of the world put together. Almost 800,000 of them, up from an already abundant 260,000 in 1960. We now boast 300 lawyers for every 100,000 citizens. But Britain, by contrast, has 82. Japan, a mere 11. It says here uh, in an article about the waste generation. One of the most arresting statistics that I have seen in a good while is that 5% of all the energy used in the United States is consumed by computers that have been left on all night. I have been guilty of doing that. My ex-girlfriend made me stop. <laughs> says, uh, we are terribly, no, we are ludicrously wasteful of resources in this country. The average American uses twice as much energy to get through life as the average European. With just 5% of the world's population, we consume 20% of its resources. These are not statistics to be proud of. And uh, he talks about immigration a few times because uh, his wife's English and has obviously migrated with him to the United States. And uh, so he talks about, uh, he says, it appears, that many of you have, uh, it appears that many of you have also experienced the mind-numbing obtuseness and inflexibility of the US Immigration and Naturalization Service. Just after that column appeared, I came across a story in the paper of a man named Raul Blanco, whose application for citizenship had been repeatedly turned down because he had failed to provide a full set of fingerprints. As Blanco patiently explained in letter after letter, he couldn't supply a full set because he had only seven fingers, having lost three in an industrial accident years earlier in his native Cuba. At last report, Blanco was still trying to get someone at the Immigration and Naturalization Service to understand his problem. He would be better off trying to find the missing fingers. So all in all, I think as you can tell from the bits that I've read out from this, I did enjoy it mainly because I enjoy Bryson's sense of humour. There have been one or two of his books where it just didn't quite work for me, but here it just amused me quite a lot. And I thought he got to offer some pretty interesting insights, you know, from being uh, an American who lived in the UK, who was married to a British woman and has moved back to America. He gave some pretty cool insights into the differences between the two cultures. This was written and published in like late 90s, like 96 to 98 or so. So a lot of it's kind of out of date, but um, you know, you can still obviously recognize the world and it was, wasn't a bad little quarantine-y read. So yeah, I gave it a four out of five and would enjoy it, would recommend it, etc. So there we have it, that's what I made of Notes from a Big Country by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.